Okay, so I hope um, I hope everybody's well. Thanks for joining again. And this is now the second lecture, uh, which is talking more about our practice. And uh, the first of these practical lectures was called Deep Moves. The second one I now called Deep Tech. Sort of the idea of thinking about urbanism and technology uh, at the same time. Because we have learned now in the lectures that all of this is entangled together in various ways. And the lives which we currently enjoy, highly connected, very global, with large access of all of us to um, ideas, economic opportunities, spaces and so on, would be unthinkable without this technology. And it's of course a term which I borrowed from um, tech, basically, technology, and also uh, people who invest in technology. And there the term deep tech basically means technology in which you not only developing software, but the software has depth in that it is linked to particular hardware. So for example, an iPhone is an example, or Alexa is an example. So you have complex cloud services in the background, but at the same time, you have a physical manifestation of this service vis-a-vis uh, -vis the consumer. You know, you have this in, in medical industry, you have it in uh, agricultural industry, in aerospace and so on. So the combination of hardware and software uh, increasingly not to sell commodities, but rather to sell services. That's the idea of deep tech. And when borrowing this term, I'm basically trying to describe uh, this sort of link between hard and software also in cities, and this sort of link then back also to understand how this technological entanglement developed over time. So that's the origin of the idea. And we are starting again uh, with this image, this image very much being, of course, again about Switzerland. And what you see here is the uh, European continent, uh, Italy, bottom left, bottom right, France, top left. And you see here the arc of the Alpine Rim with these white snowy mountains curling across the continent exactly at the moment where the Italian peninsula is grafted onto the larger body of Europe. So basically these mountains still rising every year by a couple of millimeters are a slow motion effect of a colossal wreckage with the African tectonic plate pushing into uh, the Eurasian plate. And what now developed in this area is this nation state of Switzerland in between the urban system of Italy and the urban system of Northern Europe, enabled by those interactions and many forms of exchange, urban exchange, but of course also differentiated by these many valleys and niches and opportunities for people to live peaceful lives and to tinker on technological inventions. And that story I want to talk about today. You have to understand that Switzerland before industrialization was a poor country. So these are people arriving at Ellis Island in the new continent, the United States of America. And like so many other poor people arriving there, you know, Italians, um, Irish people, and so on, also the Swiss were seen with some degree of suspicion at first, um, because of course always the poorest of them had to travel. 
And only through industrialization, step by step, Switzerland became this wealthy nation state it is today. And that has very much to do with this intersection of urban exchange of ideas, north-south, and many spatial niches, each west. A national boundary which allowed these people to live fairly secure lives. You know, the Huguenots came from France, um, fleeing the pogroms there, which were directed against their faith, started to settle in Western Switzerland and were basically an important part of starting the Swiss watch industry. During the revolutionary times of the 18, around 1848, uh, the sort of liberal revolutions which happened in all of Europe, Switzerland was one of the countries where this revolution actually succeeded. And after the reaction set in in other nations, um, a lot of people actually migrated or emigrated to Switzerland because they were able to think freely. You know, a lot of professors came at that time, thinkers, but also entrepreneurs. In Switzerland, even Lenin was finding a refuge for quite a while before he was put into a sealed train wagon and sent back to Russia. So in this moment of at the crosshair of the urban European system and the topographical differentiation of the Alpine Rim within the system boundaries of a tiny nation state, um, these industrial opportunities, of course, became interesting. And you see them here in gray, uh, all the way along the Alpine Rim, always in the valleys. In the valleys, of course, also, because there you had cheap energy in the form of running water. You know, water running downhill, which you could use to harvest energy from. And you had an eager population, poor, not very successful as farmers and therefore willing to learn the new ways of industry and make a living. It was also the moment when railroads were the last best thing, the killer application of the age. And the first railroads were always private investments. You see here in black the first railroad systems which were built up to 1865. Then in green, what happened until 1885. And then in red, the very last extensions after the turn of the century. And only much later, these different railroad companies were fused together, at least in part, to the Swiss federal railway system uh, which we know today, which still has portions of Switzerland being served only by private uh, companies. So these hills were linked to the world. Here, for example, the railroad line via the Bernina Pass linking Switzerland to northern Italy. And they were increasingly, of course, not run anymore by coal, but by electrical power. So again here, these early forms of energy fueling this moment of industrialization which transformed this country from poor mercenaries and migrants to the industrialist, increasingly also banking-driven uh, country we are today. Because everything which came in the wake of course, had to do with industrialization. Industrialization didn't bring just industry and energy and railroads. It also brought the banks which were used to finance the industry. 
the insurance companies and reinsurance companies which were used to insure these large capital, capital investments. And a lot of these institutions which still make Switzerland stable and functional today are basically inventions and foundations of this early nation state after 1848. And at that moment also, because of course, um, national territory became integrated, it became defended by an increasingly mobile army, it became standardized in terms of custom boundaries between provinces being eradicated, time differences being ended and standardized, with markets being opened all over this tiny nation, it became, of course, increasingly irrelevant to have city walls. So what you have here, for example, in the south of Zurich, are still the city walls. But very quickly, these city walls, like what happened in many parts in Europe, were covered by the new boulevards or the ring road in Vienna. Boulevard basically being a term which is derived from the French word for um, a city wall, right? And um, that basically was the start of our territorially integrated, industrialized nation state, which step by step through the emancipation of the people working in these industries then became the social welfare state which we still have today. They produced turbines and ships, generators and transformers, and increasingly were growing these industrial sites uh, up to around the 1980s, with industry then leaving the energy-rich sites of the Alpine Valleys, where industry, by the way, was able to be develop, developed far away from the urban guilds, who of course were not particularly interested in these new forms of production because they were trying to propose and continue their guild way of manufacturing products, right? So industry happened outside of the cities because you had free space, out of the urban regime within the city walls. You had energy and you had um, a population who was eager to work. But as soon as the railroad became denser, the railroad network became denser, and as soon as electrification on the one hand and coal on the other hand became efficient enough, um, then, of course, it started to make sense to locate industry where the, where the people were and where the railroad nodes were. So large industrial sites started to develop, uh, for example, in Erlikon, right outside of the uh, area of Zurich. Companies which were at that time, of course, quite enlightened which were interested in the welfare of their workers. For example, here with that welfare building on the right hand side with a beautiful park around it, which still exists today. And um, this um, entrance door into this entire site uh, on the left, where people on the one hand produced calculators on the left hand side, but also ammunition on the right hand side. And then, after the 1980s, the industries, of course, you all know that, were increasingly interested in lowering cost, getting access to cheaper labor, also less regulated labor. And while at the same time, as we have seen in earlier lectures, infrastructures became more powerful, shipping and transport became more easy, and on the other hand, 
step by step also digital infrastructures became so performative that you could link formerly co-located supply chains now via these digital tools also over the span of countries, even continents. At that moment, of course, industry started moving out. So you have here old industrial areas, uh, you have the new industrial areas increasingly going towards more value added or more innovation driven, um, more knowledge based uh, type of industries while the former mechanical industries resulted in these large post-industrial sites, many of which are now being used for urban neighborhoods. So for example, there's Zurich Erlikon, the same image you have seen before as a historical image, this from the other side now seen um, today, where large parts in the center of the image of these formal industrial sites have now been turned into living, office, and so on. Again, something which happens all over the world, where former montage halls have been turned into parks. And where, however, still in these niches, towns, villages, valleys, in the Alpine Rim industry is present. However, today, of course, it's an industry which is not about mass production, not about mechanical production, but it's very much an industry being part of the knowledge economy. So, for example, in these valleys, in between mountains, you have the place where the famous Swiss army knife is being produced, Victorinox, you know, by workers there from the valleys, of course, by now also a fair amount of migrants. Migrants in Switzerland, by the way, is not a pejorative term at all. I'm five eighth non-Swiss, even so I have a Swiss passport. 30% of the Swiss population is foreign born and about one third of all couples are mixed. So, um, you know, we are a kind of a melting pot of Europe. But you also have, of course, pharma industry, um, which uh, followed. What is interesting is all of this goes back to textiles. So in the beginning, the Swiss were working on textile, specifically in the eastern part of Switzerland, where textile industrialists in the beginning still very manufacturing, gave farmers an additional source of income. First with flax, which was local, then increasingly cotton was imported. Then due to the sea blockade of Napoleon vis-a-vis -vis England, um, British machinery, which originally was imported into Switzerland, running the first industries, was not available anymore, so the Swiss had to start building their own machines. And at the same time, they had to invent their own dyes. The dyes were the source of the chemical industry. The textile machinery was the source of the mechanical industry, and both of which, of course, is at the core of what Switzerland is still doing, but now in a much more um, specialized manner. So when you look at all the products which Switzerland exports, so these are finished products, they are portions of products around a variety of fields. Again, you see chemical, pharma and mechanical at the top, what I just mentioned before. You see the watches bottom left, you see food, you see textile, you see gold. There's a big amount of gold production in Switzerland also. You know, turning them into um, standardized um, forms of gold storage, of course. So when you look at everything Switzerland produces, then you can 
see which products and product classes are similar to each other. This is work done by Cesar Hidalgo at the MIT Media Lab, who analyzes what he calls the econo economic complexity of a country. And he defines the economic complexity as the spectrum of differentiated industrial goods. A national economy is exporting and he looks at the depth of complexity and innovation in each of these products as well as he looks at the range uh, of the products um, which are present in, an, uh, in a national economy. And what he sees is interesting in a sense that um, when you characterize a national economy with the GDP, for example here the example of Chile versus Malaysia, then two countries might look extremely similar. So the GDP of Chile and the GDP of Malaysia are almost exactly the same. They have similar amounts of education. Uh, you know, it, it, they're actually in many ways very similar countries. However, Chile's economy and GDP is very much based on resource extraction and exporting raw materials, mainly copper, versus Malaysia, whose export is dominated by industrial products, for example, here specifically electronic microcircuits. And Hidalgo argues that these countries might have the same GDP, and yet their economies are fundamentally different. Chile's economy is much less complex than Malaysia's economy. So there's much less knowledge involved. The people are less qualified um, simply because the economic basis is a different one. What he also wrote in another paper is that economic complexity correlates to equality in terms of salaries and income. So the more complex an economy is, the more equal it tends to be in terms of income, which makes a huge amount of sense, of course, because uh, you know, in a highly complex, industrialized, very specialized uh, knowledge economy, uh, you need to treat your people well because they're your most important resource. And on the other hand, people are also, they have enough choices to leave you as an industrialist if you don't treat them well enough. So inherently, um, economic complexity scales with a certain equality in a national economy. So what you see here in the yellow rectangle top left is in black top left Chile, in black middle you see Malaysia again, and at the bottom right you see Switzerland. This doesn't mean Switzerland is a paradise, it also doesn't mean uh, we are a highly equal society. It simply means that industry is not only an economic driver, it is also a political driver. And again, it shows us that economy, politics, and I would argue even space and urban development are all linked together. Because in my thinking, the um, origin of all of this is not Swiss ingenuity or that we somehow morally superior people, not at all, right? Again, we started being extremely poor, but what's interesting is that the combination of a highly differentiated subsidiary space with urban interactions and exchange leads to the co-development 
of space, industry and economy in a way which ultimately generates a certain degree of fairness and in that sense a fairly resilient um, economy. And this story of linking space, economy and governance is one which we want to tell in this book, The Industrious City, Urban Industry in the Digital Age. Of course, also seeing what digitalization does to all of this because it both strengthens as well as undermines everything I have just told you right now. And it's also a book about some projects we are working on and is, by the way, almost done printing, so we should have any day it should uh, arrive in the office as a printed book. And I want to take you now on this journey to see a bit what this all means when you now look at these spaces a bit more precisely. This is Switzerland. Um, in black you see the inhabited areas, so the settlements. You see this very diffused decentralized way Switzerland is organized, completely different, for example, from Russia, where Moscow is a gigantic centralized dot. All opportunities are almost only located in Moscow. Ekaterinburg has some opportunities, maybe Vladivostok, but then quite soon the opportunities are gone, right? And if you are ambitious and want to do something with your life, you're almost forced to um, go to Moscow, study there, get a job there, because Moscow is the portal to the world, right? In Switzerland, these opportunities are more diffused, more decentralized. And I would argue they are such because of this very decentralized way in which value has been generated over time. Where in tiny places, in very provincial towns, little industries developed, uh, like here the Sig Waldsmühle area in Frauenfeld, driven by peripheral water power, where towns developed which gave people with ideas a space to settle. So for example, the Huguenots, which came from France, and to settle in a way uh, where industry became a core part of the DNA of this town, where, for example, all of these longitudinal buildings you see here have workshops in the ground floors, illuminated by daylight from two sides, with apartments on top, um, La Chaudfond and Le Local being these famous um, watchmaking towns which are almost a kind of a watchmaking urbanism. You know, the entire town is built around the idea of production. But you then also have, over a series of steps, the development of global giants like Global Pharma, Roche and Novartis, for example, in Basel, both of these extremely powerful global companies being located in this tiny town on the border between Switzerland and Germany. So here this tower by Herzog de Meuron on the right. And you also have Zurich, you know, where you have these layers of industry um, at the very core of the city, some being turned into living neighborhoods now so, for example, this entire part here is called Zurich West, which was formerly um, the location of, for example, Echevis, which was producing ships and sending them to all of the world. Um, but this place now has in parts been turned into a living and working area, so working in terms of office working. Um, but some industry is still there embedded on the one hand spatially but also functionally into the city. And that means that this location mosaic of the larger metro region of Zurich, which we have seen in earlier lectures, is actually infused with 
the production of ideas here in blue. For example, the ETH here, the, the downtown university district, the University of Zurich. So everything in blue has to do with the production of ideas and everything in red has to do with the production of things. And when you now look into this production of things a bit more closely, then you see these vestiges of urban production which developed over the last two and a half centuries still embedded in the city. So places which in around 1900 looked like this still operate. Workers still find jobs, not as many as ever before, of course, but they still find jobs. And new building typologies are developing. For example, the NERD um, built by Beat Roten, uh, architect in Winterthur, you know, on the one hand, on the right, containing a company which is involved in scenography, so they're building interior designs and event designs. But on the left, you have the famous fry talk bags, you know, a company which takes truck tarps and turns them into bags, which you might have seen. And you also have new companies, for example, a local startup which produces coffee machines. Or you have art which is being produced. So this, uh, this um, former factory near St. Gallen is one of the hotspots of global art production, you know, where a lot of artists from all over the world, the US, China, and whatnot, are coming to produce their art pieces in this highly alchemistic manner, but in parts, of course, also being completely digitized. So what you, have see, what you see here is basically a gigantic CNC machine which is able to produce very, very big sculptures, cutting away layer by layer and turning them into art. And you have entirely new typologies of spaces and technology also. So here, the ETH DFAB Center in um, Zurich, where you have to imagine that the entire room, the entire space you see here is accessible to these robotic arms. So this entire space is basically a 3D production machine, right? Every single point in this space is accessible by these robots. And these robots can have manipulators, effectuators at their fingertips, so to speak, which are able to produce almost anything you want to, right? It's a, it's a kind of an industry which became highly versatile and adaptable. Thought, for example, by these two people who I really like quite a lot, uh, Matthias Kohler and Fabio Gomazio, um, running their chair at the ETH of Zurich, being interested in the roboterization, so to speak, of the construction industry. So that means the industry of today is spanning from the very digital, highly knowledge intense to the traditional haptic, matter-based, but equally knowledge intense ways of production. And all of that can easily happen in the city because knowledge workers want to live in cities, right? If industries become increasingly knowledge intensive, you need people who can run your machines and write your programs, and these people like to live in cities. So it is interesting for, cities, for, for industries to be close to cities. Second point is that um, industry wants to be close to innovation centers, for example, universities. And finally, industry also wants to be close to consumer markets. So again, their in industry is interested in locating back into the city. So coming back 
from China, for example, and building a building in the center of one of these Swiss towns. However, uh, and, then, and then of course you also have digitalization, which basically means that the knowledge industry of the future is increasingly emission-free, it's less noisy, less dusty, it has smaller footprints, and it is consisting more of decentralized but networked units, less based on mass production, but rather on clever ways of mass customization, which you can do in networks of smaller companies. So the industry coming back to the city is very much an industry of a smaller scale, higher, higher network, uh, with increasingly digital means of organizing themselves. This has negative consequences also. Um, you know that, for example, this industry tends to occupy public space for their logistics, it tends to stress the urban welfare system by all the people who are in the gig industry, maybe all of a sudden being out of a job. Um, but again, as I said, it also has positive consequences. And the book is about the story of this new industry coming back. Now, importantly, however, there's another trend which happened over the last 20 years, which is, ac which is actually working against this re-industrialization of cities. You know, so the, a, pen, a, a, a tendency of post-industrialization is now overlapping with a tendency of re-industrialization. So what you see here is one of these old um, urban production places, traditional, you know, from the beginning of the last century, with a production hall on the back and the owner's living quarter uh, in the front. And what you see here, these, um, these steel sticks basically indicate there will be a building built. This is a Swiss way of letting the neighbors know how high this building is. And if you don't like the height as a neighbor, you can go to the municipality or the city and um, um, basically argue against this new building. But basically it means this building will be demolished. So there's a lot of change where productive spaces and capabilities are demolished and taken out of the urban space. The same is true also of course here where a lot of industry is disappearing. And this trend you can quantify, so what you have here in dark blue with these small dots on the background of the administrative region of the city of Zurich are these brownfield areas which are being turned into new urban developments, urban developments which contain everything, so from housing to retail to offices, storage and other uses, but very rarely these new developments contain production. So we are losing productive capabilities and at the same time we are seeing that industry would like to come back to the city. So for example in the last 25 years we turned the blue area on the left into this mixed use area on the right which sounds like a success story in many ways. You know gentrification, urban development, brownfield developments and so on. But it also means a loss of capability, a loss of resilience in that sense. Now the politics of Zurich reacted to that and in 2007 and politically defined that all of these last industrial areas here in blue have to remain industry. That has two consequences. First of all, it still um, can be used by industry you are allowed to make noise, etc. But at the same time, by keeping it industrial zone, you keep the land price low. And with that, you allow for this type of urban production developments to happen. Because urban industry cannot 
generate the same return on investments as office or housing. And so you need to force the, the developers and owners into keeping industry in many ways by political means. And with that, of course, you're also preventing your economic, your land market in the city from being fully gentrified. Right? You're intervening um, in the urban land market. So these are projects we are working on in the office, um, which all have to do with this urban industry. And I want to show you three of them. The, the um, SBB workshop areas, the so Swiss Federal Railway workshop areas, technology cluster Zug, and the Rheinmetall air defense area in Erlikon. So these are the SBB Werkstätten. Um, you have to know that the Swiss Federal Railways is of course a transport company, but a lot of the income they're generating right now is from real estate. Because by improving and making more efficient their operations, they were able to liberate rail yards and montage halls and are turning them into highly profitable urban developments. Cross financing our public transport system. And also here in these workshops, um, the locomotives and wagons which were um, repaired here are slowly leaving. And also here, the Swiss Federal Railway was of course interested in building housing. The city, however, as we have seen earlier, did not want to allow that. And they hired us as an office to make a secret study just for the city with some other stakeholders to figure out uh, what we could do in terms of keeping this for urban production rather than for more highly profitable urban developments. So we had to look exactly how these site operates. Some of it is actually historically quite, quite valuable. We also looked very precisely at the spatial typologies these new forms of urban industry actually needs. Because we didn't have a program, we didn't have a user, so we, we, we needed to figure out a way of program the area without programming it. Right? So of giving the area the typological um, makeup or the, the, the typological structure in order to accommodate various forms of urban industry. So we argued that for urban industry of the future, you need labs for high-tech technology. You, lead, you need workshops, you need ateliers, and you need meeting places. And different types of urban industries might use these spaces in different combinations. So for example, a company, a startup which makes prosthetics might use some medical med tech and some workshop area. They have industrial designers working them and might also do physiotherapy. Uh, you know, the gaming industry, they might do 3D printing, they're doing specific mobile applications and also interaction design and so on and so on. And these types of opportunities and spaces we were embedding in the city of Zurich, which is an academic place, a creative place, a place where also people still have um, an education in crafts and trades, and it's also an industrial space. So we were embedding it into the urban economy of the city. And then the question was very much, how can you open up and generate interfaces to these formerly closed areas with the aim of having this site grow together uh, with the city. So we added squares, we added an inner um, path going through the halls and the open spaces. We added a new access road, which allowed us to place new buildings uh, on the periphery where the railroad tracks might not be used anymore. 
and turns that therefore into a structured way of thinking about the future of this bill of this site adding then our space typologies and proposing this as a kind of an an urban production site what we called the Zurich, Zurich workshops um, so that the area has both the structure and the identity in order to be a successful development. Another very similar question we were asked by a developer who is working with Rheinmetall Air Defense. So this is um, an air defense industry company with a seat in Düsseldorf and a local production area in Zurich. And uh, they're on a site which formerly was a place of the Swiss tool making factory, Erlikon, which, which you see here, which again was an extension of the machine factory in Erlikon, which uh, is for a while was kind of world famous. Again, this is this beautiful building which we have seen earlier. Today, it is not so heavily used, but they still produce air defense systems here, which is kind of a gruesome uh, thing to uh, witness, but um, interesting. And with students at Harvard, we were trying to find ways of rethinking this area in many different types of strategies, but always with the aim of keeping urban production on location. That was the rule of the game, so to speak. So for example, one team was really thinking about life cycle and the idea of keeping the shed roofs, but adding new housing um, um, possibilities into the halls, but by means which were cost effective and recyclable. These students were thinking about a kind of a vertical village with a market at the bottom, housing at the top and a shared communal greenhouse on the roof where then on both sides you had living but also production areas turning this whole thing into a kind of a, a mini Sparta of urban production probably also with cooperatives being involved another student team was thinking about stacking industry in new ways trying to put the industrial floor to a higher level so that the street level actually remains an interface with the city. The problem of industry is that everything working on the ground floor means you have very long, highly non-interactive facades towards the city. A kind of a stacking which then also went underground, a lot of logistics then being underground. Or you had students who were taking the idea of Vanelle factory in Rotterdam, thinking about this plug-in industry, where you have the existing uh, row of this very this existing very long row of offices becoming kind of a backbone, a spine into which you could put large uh, industrial units of a new company coming in having some individual spaces, but also access to the co-working and incubation spaces of the central spine. You also have small companies, uh, medium companies or small companies, all linked via the spine with each other if they choose to do so. At the end, you would have an urban farm, verticalized also. And in the beginning, you would have an urban hub with hotel culture and some living linking the project into the city. Or another team was thinking that urban industry could become the theme park of the future. So the excitement you had in the past or as a tourist when visiting market places where urban life is bustling around and a lot of things are hap happening in a very haptic way they thought, why couldn't industry work similarly? So they had the idea of putting this robotic wall, uh, which has logistical functions in front of the um, building, where you would have a kind of um, an, an exchange in marketplace, performance space in the beginning and in the entrance and so on. Or last person was basically thinking about 
the flows on a differentiated site where almost everything is built new. So she was uh, working with a demolished site. She only kept this welfare building, uh, which you have seen in the beginning. And these flows were all organized around this central heart, which was a kind of a highly agile, um, highly robotized place of production with an infrastructural core serving as a logistical vertical element where flows could happen over different floors, where you would have a clinic part, where people also could get consulting, other people on the site could get consulting. At the bottom you have a production and an event area, on the top you have a roof terrace and photovoltaics. And all of that is embedded into a larger context. Now, this always generates the question, well, urban industry in the center of a town, how do you deal with logistics? Specifically, when in the age of just-in-time production, logistics is not anymore happening in bulk, at individual moments per day or per week, but happens continuously in the form of perma-logistics. Of course, putting an immense strain on specifically the public road system. So there's an interesting idea in Switzerland to build an underground tunnel system, fully digitized with autonomous vehicles, linking Switzerland again in this east-west axis and linking all the most important urban centers. This system would again be privately financed. Apparently it's a business case which functions. It's um, also a place where you could do some storage, which could have some storage functions. So things could just sit there for hours or days. Uh, of course you would have um, a digital fallout, knowing a lot about what people order and buy, <laughs> trade and produce. And uh, again, it's this typically Swiss way of interaction between private money and politics in an interesting way, so I mean this positively, where politics allows the framework to function and private money actually runs the investment. And all of that together would allow us to rethink our cities in terms of Industry 4.0, so a highly automated, digitalized, um, knowledge-intense, innovation-based uh, industry of the future, which is vertical, which has to do with new mobility and urban logistics which is linking us together in new ways. Maybe then also urban farming can play in, a new material culture can play in, a new uh, economic system could play in. By the way, this is a Russian person, Vitalik, who I think, I think I have Buterin exactly, Buterin or something. He is quite famous here in Switzerland because he was a co-initiator of the Crypto Valley in Zug and invented the idea or has a startup and a system called Ethereum, which is a blockchain system. And of course you have corporate culture, you have new media ideas. So out of all of this together, this industrious city could become a kind of a new way of working, living, producing and feasting together, so to speak. Now what we, tools for, what we need for this is basically flexible tools for planning, we need flexible typologies, we need to be able to do incremental development also, we need to include the users, we need to think about cheap buildings and adaptive reuse. Most importantly, we need to control land value by zones for industry and production, and we need a lot of innovation in logistics, in energy, in planning and in operations in order for this industrial city to function. 
a completely different way of thinking about this urban production is basically the Swiss Innovation Park, another project which we won, um, which is now a bit challenged based on legal issues which have to do with specifics of the Swiss um, building law. Uh, but the idea was that uh, in this large area to the north of Zurich, at a potential link via old country roads now being rediscovered, we could link together um, places of ideas, so ETH, university, maybe a new hospital, and uh, to this uh, innovation park, which would be built on the former or, or on an airfield formerly used by the Swiss army. And our task and the project with which we won the competition was basically to turn this field into a urban innovation park. And our idea here was very much, again, like now you now already learned from me, to link the scales together. So you see here very nicely the very, very large scale of the airfield, which is still thought to be operational. An airfield, however, which now also in parts at least er serves as an urban park with a lot of green. You have here a kind of a landscape axis giving people access to this large scale by view corridors. Um, you have here a kind of a road which we called the parkway which links this new urban area in the back with addresses which are accessible by cars and trucks. But we equally link this new area via an urban boulevard and spine directly to the existing town. You see this here. And in this system we then generate anchors which have strong identities and are visible, including this new pavilion. So this is our idea for a, a museum of natural systems. This is the idea of a kind of a big academic center for collaborations. Here we, we have what we call the innovation village, so small scaled around these courtyards. Here we have what we call urban industry, sorry, innovation industry, larger scales with a link both to the urban spine as well as to the more regional spine. And all of that together, these different typologies allow us then to hopefully generate as many meaningful interactions as possible. So you see here again the, the large scale of the site. You see here the windows, the landscape windows into the site. You see the parkway uh, going through, the boulevard going in, and small scale, larger scale, specific buildings all linked together so that maybe in the future you can jog along this parkway, park on one side, urban industry on the other side, um, all of which was quite carefully developed in terms also of address roads and logistical roads of this central boulevard having also tramway and tram stops which give a higher degree of accessibility to the site and the idea of this central boulevard was also that it's actually car free, so you only have pedestrians and tram. And the idea would be that here you can have um, moments of urban interaction density. For example, a cafe in the one hand, but also show windows of these um, global companies uh, on the other hand. Here the idea of this axis um, which is more cultural. On the left you have this historic hangar, on the right you would have this new museum of natural systems. Also here, then a view into this new site. This now changed a lot, politically complex, um, etc, etc, so it doesn't have this clarity anymore, unfortunately, but it's still a kind of a super interesting project. Um, which allows very dense moments, but also moments where you are really still connected uh, to the topography of Switzerland.
you know, and then this would, of course, for example, develop step by step, where first the existing hangars would be used, for example, for the ETH, where then in the next step you would have a first site being developing. This pavilion, which originally was at the entrance, could move and always focus on moments of entry. Then you have a first academic module being built and a kind of a water management park being implemented. And this is now the pavilion which they have built already, which is functioning. Now the last architectural building I want to show you is the technology cluster of Zug. Also a project which we won. And um, Fauzug is basically a white goods manufacturer. So they produce ovens, refrigerators, washing machines, dishwashers, and so on. And they historically produced this in close proximity to the city of Zug. And the city of Zug is one of these small but highly globalized um, towns in Switzerland, which is really embedded in this amazing scenery. Um, and the idea is to now not only have Fauzug as being part of this site, but also new companies, um, you know, specific companies, but also smaller firms, uh, maybe ETH spin-offs and so on, but also living, cafe, maybe a showroom and so on. What is interesting about the location, it's basically that originally this location here in blue was far outside the city walls of Zug. And then over time, the city grew, wrapped itself around uh, this in the industrial site. And this, this industrial site is now pretty much exactly in between the historic cores of the city of Zug on the right and the city of Bar uh, on the left. And the industry always stayed there uh, and the idea was to, or the idea still is, to turn this industry into a more automated, um, robotized, data-driven uh, industry uh, of the future. So the basic plan is to take Fauzu, which is here in blue, to push it back and stack it so that the um, rest uh, of the site becomes accessible and can turn into this mix of other industrial companies of production and even living. So our competition project proposed that we turn this into that. And again here you see our main ideas, uh, you know, of a big square at the cross section of, an, of a resilient urban street system. Via these big squares and streets you get access to smaller squares. From there you enter the inside of the site with a, with a bit more hidden squares and so on. Um, where um, you would have the strictly industrial uses more in the northern part stacked above each other. Here in the southern part it would be more mixed specifically also with the idea of this very adaptable plinths where you could have different types of uses, so from production to thinking to um, eating also and so on, organized around this courtyard. So this would be then the urban volumes allowing for this. In the high rises you always have housing these lower blocks are offices and the plinths are urban production. And the idea of the competition, and we are now translating this step by step, was very much that the original site here, the southern part of the site with the uh, existing um, administration building and workshops which are all still operational and will remain operational in the future also, here's the big press uh, located that we would take this site, we would analyze it, we would cut 
the public space system which we envision into the site, um, thereby already here allowing a different grain of industry to enter the location, new addresses being developed, fire protection being enabled, and temporary uses therefore being possible. And then step by step in this grid, which we now already developed very early on, we would then place the new buildings. And basically this is what we're doing right now. It looks very different, but the idea uh, remained intact. So the final aim is that instead of additional mass just being density, we are more interested in a density of interaction and possibilities and opportunities. So from the very large scale of this mountain in the back, you go to the urban scale, from the urban scale you go to the area scale, to this alley for example, and from the area, on the area scale you have access to, let's say, stores, but you can also go to a more intimate scale of the courtyard around which you have different types of functions. You have above a kind of a terrace, which is again a bit more intimate, for example, only serving these uh, office workers, until finally you end up with the private lodges of the people living there. Again, a form of nesting. This site now has been turned into building, this, this idea now has been turned into building law on a kind of an abstract idea of planning it. The big difficulty is, of course, that we're really transforming an operational industrial site, which has to keep operational the entire time of transformation. We planned that in detail uh, over many changes already, turning this today's um, uh, site in 2018 in phase one to the future site in 2045 in phase eight. I mean, all of this, of course, being highly hypothetical. And in this transformation plan, we are looking always at the Rochard areas, so the places you need to demolish in order to generate space uh, into the new buildings and everything which happens underground, all of that over the course of uh, 30 years. This is a particular building I show you quickly, which we developed for the site, which we didn't win, unfortunately. Uh, but it was our idea of how to how to could actually operate now montage level, and then we have the R and D floors uh, above, looking down onto the montage. But another building we actually are uh, uh, were um, doing or are doing. It's under construction right now. It's this um, mobility hub, where new forms of mobility um, are part of the program, so to speak. Um, this is the BIM model, an early BIM model of the project. You see here how it's functioning. What is interesting is basically from the right you have the new peripheral road entering the city and this mobility hub is right at the gate of this new smart city of Zug. And you basically have an underground, which is public. Then from plus one upwards, you have the parking lots of the workers. And in the middle, you have a store, a very large um, craft store, so to speak. And in front here, underneath the bridge, you have the what we call the terminal, where you can rent a bike or a scooter, where you have postal box services and so on. And above here, um, in the first floor, we have the exchange station, where in the future the idea is that an electric car, which is, extreme, which is increasingly autonomous, could be left, while you are then taking the bridge, which brings you to the technology cluster Zug, the car would then automatically park itself. So the thinking was that uh, we needed a... Um, floor space without columns, so that in the future these cars can also park more densely, and in general we wanted to make it future-proof. 
Uh, and then we wrapped the whole thing, this whole spiral, we wrapped uh, with these uh, aluminum walls, uh, which on the one hand give light, um, are necessary for smoke evacuation in terms of fire, but at the same time also protect neighbors from the lights of the cars. Right. So this is now the latest incarnation with now with a wooden facade uh, in the way it is currently being built. The idea is, of course, that this line of the bridge, which starts at the technology cluster, brings you over the road to this terminal where you exchange your car, and then it brings you all the way up like a continuous line to the upper floors of the building. And all of this is linked also to a larger idea of um, this Zug Nord, where we also have experimented with an autonomous shuttle being provided by the Swiss Federal Railways, uh, which didn't work quite so well yet, but the idea was that the railroad station and the technology cluster are linked by these autonomous means. Now, in order to organize this complex transformation over these many years, we established a tool of management. Uh, it's a digital twin. Some of you might have heard that term already. And the idea of this digital twin now is that it works on the one hand, um, of course, as a 3D model. On the other hand, as a gigantic database, so this is only a small excerpt out of a very, very large database, uh, which is a digital twin on an urban level. So this is sort of building information modeling, so BIM, but with urban elements. So for example, a floor, you know, an entire rectangle, which is a floor of a building. And with this tool, we control um, various things. We control the master plan in this urban design BIM way because the volume we can build on the site has now been locked at not quite one million square meters of space which we are allowed to build. This is locked in by the city and it's legally required that we conform with it. So we need to control the master plan quite precisely in terms of the volume which we're generating. Of course, we need to also control the master plan in terms of the real estate case which we are developing, meaning we need to know what rentable floor areas which we are generating over time. We need to be able to build in it. So there's a link to um, construction, so the BIM as you probably know it. There's a link also to facility management, so computer-aided facility management. And there's also an innovation case. The idea is that, that the entire data structure which we are generating uh, is also accessible to innovation. For example, if you have a startup on site, they can access this data and, for example, make calculations based on the energy consumption of the building. So the entire the idea behind it is basically structured information over the entire life cycle of buildings of areas and maybe even cities. And here an idea you need to understand is that whenever you talk about the dig digitization of the environment, there are two basic approaches and two principal ways of conceptualizing this. On the one hand, whenever you build something, you can um, aggregate the building with and from discrete elements like these little Lego blocks. That's how you, we normally think about BIM, you know, so a column or a wall is a discrete element which you can plan, you draw it, you label it and you attach data to that element. This is complicated, tedious, painful, but actually conceptually quite easy. It's a form of accounting and easy to understand. And if you are very precise about it, also not that complicated to implement. 
However, reality, of course, is continuous. You know, so this sand castle would be very hard to itemize into elements, even so, of course, we all know that individual grains of sand, basically, are the constituent element of this, of this quote-unquote building, right? But you cannot track every grain of sand. So that means you need to start scanning this continuous reality and you need to um, you need to um, segmenting it into um, individual components you know so you need to apply forms of machine learning and so on which have to do with taking a continuous reality and making it manageable in terms of discrete elements there's a company called Nomoko uh, who is trying to do that very much with the business model uh, of training autonomous cars, not expensively in real environments, but much more inexpensively in virtual environments. So that's why they have an incentive of actually doing this amazing amount of work of turning a um, an existing reality, scanning it with high definition and therefore making it, making it accessible to um, um, analyze, uh, analysis uh, with machine learning tools, for example. Or you see this here, the concept of scanning something in high definition, abstracting it, and then with tools of machine learning segmentizing it into objects. Now I'm highly critical about a lot of this because it's actually extremely hard to do and the more continuous your reality is the harder it is but nevertheless the future we could envision is that the digital twin is fed both by discrete elements so BIM or Internet of Things as well as continuous elements, scanning or big data, which needs to go through some process of segmentation so that you could have these different cases, use cases, which we, which we have seen in the ZOOC, the technology cluster ZOOC, in order to better operate, to better use, and to do some form of scenario planning of the city. And now, in the last thing, I want to show you a, pro a spin off uh, of our company, which tries to do the latter. So tries to, to take data, which we find now increasingly in the urban environment, of course, produced by us all, because increasingly as users, we are tracked by big data. And also increasingly, we have access to uh, open data provided by, for example, governments. And we want to turn this location mosaic, which you have now seen a couple of times, into something which is increasingly automated. So while the earlier location mosaic, you know, this green, magenta, black map I'm showing you several times right now, we already turned this into something we can do with GIS and statistics. So this is not anymore done by hand, but it's with GIS and statistics. And as soon as we have that as a concept, we can also take the um, functional region of Zurich, turn that idea of this big database into a platform and with that can uh, establish a market and therefore a business case. Um, because what's happening right now is, of course, that everybody of us leaves data trails. This is one person over three years. And you see here the place he lives. You see here his favorite cafe. You see here our office. And magenta means the person is resting, sitting. Uh, in orange, you see um, the person in a transport system here, the public transport of the bus. And in blue, you see the person walking. 
This is basically Google location history analyzed with big data tools. And that allows us to jump from something we did with CAD and statistics, but very manually in the beginning, to something which we did with GIS and statistics here in the middle, to increasingly something which we can do uh, with this open, uh, with um, open and big data, um, but in an increasingly automated way. And the idea, of course, is that we take our interest in spatial planning, we add digitalization and open government strategy so that we can do urban development smarter, evidence-based and with forms of, trans of participation with our smart use platform as an integrated solution. This is the startup which we founded, uh, which tries to bring together spatial planning data and governance. Very important, we need to add governance because there is an issue of um, privacy, data protection and so on, which is inevitably uh, important. But what it means is that when we think about urban densification, we can also, and we understand that uh, spatial and urban planning is changing from top-down to collaborative to evidence-based, then out of that comes an opportunity and a necessity, which is that data and governance together can help uh, spatial planning. And I quickly want to show you now what this could look like. So this is basically from our startup, CVD, Civic Data Intelligence. Oops, now I need to realize, I need to stop share and start sharing. Boink, boink. So I'm almost done, by the way, so no worries. I do this quickly. Um, but again, CVD, Civic Data Intelligence, the team is growing. Uh, so next to the co-founders, Joris, uh, Oleg, and myself, so spatial development, open data, urban design. We now have a CEO, a CTO, and a CEO. So architects and economists, but also biologists. She has a PhD in coral reef science, you know, the idea of diversity in space. Uh, we have um, condensed matter physics, uh, so a physics background, programming, back end, another physics person programming front end. Again, the attempt of linking a spatial reality and political reality with an increasingly performing technological reality so that we can prepare digital tools for the analog city. So we're still interested in analog spaces. The aim is always to enable the physical space with as much quality of life, economic and political opportunities as possible. But we are now adding a digital toolbox to this dream. Um, so we want to know how these people use space and what they think about. And we are embedding this into these layers, which you by now know from topography, topology, structure, function, and use, you know, where the time scale gets increasingly fast, but the investment gets increasingly more expensive and complicated. So this is the landscape features which I have shown you where Switzerland is embedded in these mountains, rivers and valleys which have been transformed over hundreds of thousands of years to which we then, acted, uh, and, uh, to which we then added the topology of connectedness, train tracks, tunnels, roads and crossings. So here you see again space syntax showing us the old village and town cores changing in the hundreds of years. Then we have the human-made location factors, which walls and buildings, which change in a matter of tens of years. Functions and function distributions, which, matter, which change in a matter of years. And use, which change in the matter of hours. So for example, what you see here 
is the accessibility of our Zug site by bikes and the advantage you have by bike in terms of public transport. So the more colored a site is, the more easily you reach this central spot with your bike as compared to public transport. And then finally, what we're doing also um, with um, a way of thinking originally established again by Cesar Hidalgo, we are also looking at how people perceive space um, in that we always give people two images taken from Google Street View. I mean, not exactly that, but something like Google Street View. We let them make choices which image they find more appealing. We then, with these choices, train a machine learning algorithm. And with this machine er learning al with this machine algorithm, we are then not only looking at individual spots on streets, but we're looking at all the streets. So we have around 30,000 data points of individual choices, you know, citizen opinion, so to speak. And we can turn these individual choices into a assessment of all public spaces in the city. And what is beautiful is, of course, is that it's kind of augmented civic data. So we have civic data as an entry point, 30,000 of them, and we turn that by machine learning into an augmented civic um, desire, right? It's a kind of a representative democracy augmented by machine learning. And again, this you of course know that uh, you know the larger scale acts on the smaller scale by forcing and enslaving. And on the other hand, we are able to, with our many moments of interaction with the physical, we are able to also change these larger scales. But the bigger you go in terms of scale, the more expensive and complicated it gets. But in order to argue for these larger changes and to better use the smaller units, more fastly changing units, we are basically with CVD trying to bring data together from very different sources, so from open data, from data which is not currently accessible to crowdsourced data, in order to look at these topics from climate energy to tourism, uh, with the platform we call Gemeindescan, which is kind of as standardized and simple that municipalities can use it. We have a data pipeline on the one hand from JIS, on the other hand from uh, other sources uh, where we pre-organize the data, for example, with Python scripts and other things into frictionless data packages, frictionless being a particular type of data standard and are then analyzing and viewing it with these no tools. The idea is to have many different microservices, which we are currently establishing pipelines of aggregating data in a way where it becomes usable and can then be, uh, on the one hand, used by individual users, but also by larger user sets. For example, um, analyzing with telecom data road traffic in a way where we can show which part of the traffic jam on a street is generated by local traffic, regional, interregional traffic, or by transit traffic. So you see here, for example, a particular mountain or hill pass in um, near Zurich. You see that around two thirds is transit traffic, which ideally actually would use a highway, but is now using a kind of a cantonal, so a more local street. So basically, we can look at a road and see the um, constitution of a traffic jam. Uh, we can also see in the same project where this traffic is coming from, um, which part of the traffic is regular. So this is 
um, commuter traffic, which part is irregular, so leisure traffic. We can also look at public transport reachability compared with population density and work density. We can look at bike commutes, and we can look at the diversity of apartments in the city, or we can also look where the dense part and the not so dense part of inhabitants in the metro region of Zurich is living. Interestingly enough, of course, you have also inside the city parts which are not so dense. We can look at a functional analysis in terms of where you could still build. So the more, the lighter, the blue, the less densely an area is settled. We can look at the demographics, so the median of age, where do young people live, families live, where do older people live. We can look at centralities uh, in towns and at commuter footprints and with heat map even at uses over the course of a day. And the idea is of course that over time we all would be enabled as citizens by digitalization to a degree that we are not anymore the victims of data extraction but we are enabled to join a civic society which controls to some degree both the data in terms of data cooperatives as well as the tools to analyze the data in a way that um, the, we are the stewards of our own spatial destinies with using data increasingly well. Again, also here the idea of collocation, of political control, of mental mapping in a service of stabilizing the local and embedded vis-a-vis -vis the connected and yet fully globalized and often extractive and adverse uh, world which we are generating when we are linking increasingly local scales to larger scales. So it's a kind of a relocalization, re-embedding strategy now here with digital tools. So that's the story. And I hope it was interesting. Thank you so much, Marcus. It was uh, as usual, super interesting and um, very beautiful project. So, um, guys, do, do you have um, questions or remarks or some ideas? Maybe one question would be is um, how would you test the uh, theories that you propose on the building? Of the future, because like I understand that they are based on the uh, previous uh, assumptions or that we had this view. Uh, however, what? How do you really know what works and what not? And if it's okay to know if something doesn't work and it's okay also and then to fix it. Okay. Again, you are always asking the good questions. Uh, first of all, again, you know whatever I'm telling you might seem complete but I'm painfully aware about everything I do not know. So to some degree, not knowing is a fact both of life as well of professional existence. There are two tools to counteract that, or three tools actually. One tool is to build structures with a certain flexibility, or what is now fashionably called resilience. The second tool is to learn from the past to project the future by understanding dynamics which are inherent in what you do. And the third tool is not to do it alone, but to enter with users, with local people in a structured way, so not in a kind of a messy way, but in a structured way into a dialogue which allows you to learn from local knowledge. And then with these tools you do, and, and with professional knowledge and craft, maybe with these four things, you do the best you can. Yeah, 
Actually, during your lecture, I thought about like um, during the first part of the of your lecture, I thought about this um, kind of uh, deindustrialization de uh, of the cities in comparison with Moscow, mm -hmm. and that's uh, al always uh, interesting for me, and it's uh, really con connected with uh, our previous uh, previous discussion after the previous lecture when Alberta asked you about this investment. So it seems to me that. Uh, the situation is uh, again uh, the following: that the role of uh, uh, of a person who proposed the project is uh, highly important because you always need kind of a negotiate and uh, you need um, a kind of um, present the project uh, in a good way because uh, in Moscow we have uh, or we had already a lot of projects and uh, we had uh, lots of competitions about these industrial areas. And uh, uh, as like what what I see now, so the investment team, so it means that uh, like uh, all the development uh, right now are turning into square meters, meters again, not into these uh, diverse uh, uh, diverse uh, diversity of functions and uh, basically amount of interactions you can have in the city. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, maybe, uh, maybe the case of Switzerland is um, a really special one, but it's uh, also interesting for me. Do it, do you have uh, any ideas on how uh, maybe in other countries, um, maybe how how can we approach it in another country? So when the um, where the um, let's say uh, the the state is more powerful in decision making. And so on. So when uh, where uh, local people uh, can have uh, this power of decision making, how do you approach it? Like from the point of uh, a professional. Uh, again, it's a very good question. Um, mm, or it's a it's a difficult question, you know, because. Um, because in theory everything is easy, right? With a better narrative and the better arguments, you convince people because they are still, um, at some point, interested in long-term value. That's theoretically the case. And there, probably, you will need to find those stakeholders who are most interested in long-term value, whoever that is, right? So in the in a city, oftentimes it's the administration and not the political level. However, the brutality of our time is that a lot of stakeholders are incentivized by short-term value. You know, politicians which are re-elected every four years, um, or uh, let's say developers who sell the project as soon as they possibly can. Uh, all of them are incentivized by short-term value or even by the appearance of short-term value, which is even worse. You know, so um, um, so that, that's the reality uh, which we have to operate in, of course. And therefore, y you, you need a lot of levels on which to act you know, for example, an associate of ours now recently returned to Riga. And, um, you know, Riga is a shrinking city. It's a depopulating city. Brain drain is a particularly difficult thing there. Um, so there's not this power of development which you have in other cities which are transforming fast and maybe too quickly. So she has a bit more time. You know, she has more maneuvering space. But still, the approach she is now taking is, uh, you know, on the one hand, politically, sort of talk to the right people, networking yourself, um, also with people who support your ideas. Secondly, academically, 
that you try to position ideas so that they're visible uh, in an ac academic context but radiate out into the larger cultural context. Then thirdly, you try to find good clients. You avoid bad clients. This is one of the key things, you know, as an architect, you are on the one hand extremely powerful because you bring oftentimes the narrative. Uh, but the actual reality of being an architect is of course much more banal uh, because you build things with other people's money. And that means you're unbelievably powerless uh, most of the time. So key is to work with the right clients and also activate communities you know so use communities as a resource because the problems of the users are the resource you are working with as an architect that means participation which oftentimes is politically legitimizing difficult projects right so it's, it's a pro forma involvement of communities. That, that's actually a gigantic mistake because what local communities can help you with is in differentiating and diversifying your ideas to a degree that they become more quote unquote sustainable or resilient in, in the best in the best of all worlds again. Again this is this is really complicated. So I think the problem you bring up with your question is that there's no single answer but you have to you have to act on all of these level and therefore also very importantly don't do things alone you know the big the biggest stupidity of architects because they're also forced into this market logic where stars rule is that they don't cooperate Right, so architects have been forced into this individualistic form-giving role which basically completely incapacit incapacitates them politically. Right, so you are treated as a star, you come in, you give a kind of a signature form, but at the same time by doing that oftentimes you lose a lot of the cooperation with other architects which potentially would be possible also so so there i would and, and probably the you know you need to you need to go a kind of a middle ground but again i think an important answer is i think in my opinion at least the age of the stars is closing and the age of well networked cooperative professionals of goodwill is maybe starting you know and I think you working and studying in this international incubator uh, you know the higher school of economics maybe this is also a way and a platform to generate the kinds of contacts and the set of narratives which allow them to have maybe a bit more meaningful um, professional existences then you were completely isolated working for your local developer. But again, it's a complicated question with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with an answer which is not easy. Thanks a lot. So who, who, are, who are you actually? Are all of you architects or like what's the mix? Cool, okay. So I'm an architect. Yeah. And I guess this will go on to architects in this group. <laughs> because, yeah, like I'm a, a digital designer and so I would like to talk a little about this stuff. Yeah, no, I think very interesting. Again, I think, you know, I think, I think the, the advantage of a course like this is, of course, that you really think interdisciplinary or transdisciplinarily about the the question what is a city right so I think this is a this is an absolutely key thing to do 
At the same time, the Achilles heel of an, of an operation like that is, of course, that you all become fuzzy generalists, right? That, uh, that um, you have insights but are not able to operationalize your insights in the daily life of an architect, you know, so maybe you go back and become, you're now, you're now a digital designer who has seen more things, so okay, but so what, what the hell do you do with it? You know, does it really affect you in your professional life? Are you able at some point to co-develop a new operating system for a neighborhood, thereby enabling a local community to take better charge of their environment, are you able to do that in collaboration with one of your colleagues at the course, right? Or are you going back and just uh, enter another web agency or, or, or whatever you do, right? And, and, and I think that the, the difficulty is and will be, what are your professional tools? You know, like what is a framework of thinking which enables you on the one hand but on the other hand, you need professional tools. You need to be really good at something in order to have a platform from which you can act. Um, and to strike that balance is extremely hard. I mean, it took me, it took me 15 years um, to become a decent architect uh, after having been a biologist, you know. And I could not have done it alone, so I can only do it with an office because um, because my specific type of thinking is too broad uh, to, for example, be really good at detailing. Right? Um, I'm, I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I I can differentiate a good and a bad detail, but I would not have the patience to develop it myself. And I think I think so. So so you need to you need to have a grand picture and at the same time a professional toolkit and then a huge amount of patience you know so so i think i think you need all of that um and but my message is only good ideas will not help you because of, you know because i think the the big problem is that we all are living uh, the age of the bullshit economy, right? Where basically, um, where basically, it is very easy to get attention by some smart-sounding ideas, and it's extremely hard to sub substantiate these ideas then with work which is really effective. Um, but maybe you can also tell me, well, Marcus, you're you're too traditionalist, you know, maybe your generation has tools which I do not yet understand well enough, um, you know, in this, in this world of influences and so on, maybe there are ways of having an impact which I do not understand perfectly myself. But my important message is um, uh, thinking grand narratives is one thing, but keeping your toolkit uh, active, working, and increasingly improve it is another thing you really need to do. You know, also, for example, when you're looking for a job, you're being hired because you're inevitable. Right? And in order to be inevitable, you need to have some things you're really good at. idea that someone has to do the, the job well because uh, otherwise we would not get the pictures that you show us in these projects that are I guess it's a lot of time spent on the, the very work the very essence of the work like working with the tools of course this is the only thing that can get us to any kind of result and the fact that uh, there should be people able to build this kind of building then of course it's a lot of work I understand that so yeah these ideas that you propose to us about the, the toolkit are also important. I, I, I can see them in the future the being kind of uh, um, decided in the way what can we actually do and what can we not, because you can imagine a lot, but 
without being able to do something by hand. You either have to have people that uh, can listen to you and do what you want, but that is not always uh, the case because uh, sometimes people want just to be able to translate your ideas into complex into material objects, and you have to be able to be yourself the, the real uh, things that you try to propose. Mm -hmm. But you know, for example, uh, it is very easy to be impressed by the images we show. But for example, really building, you know, to really turn these images into reality, into built reality, is something which we still have to prove. You know, we haven't built so much yet. And I know uh, brutally and painfully all the things which can go wrong from translating these images into built reality. You know, they, they, they go wrong in so many ways. So an architectural practice is also very much the story of everything which can go wrong. Because as an architect, you can screw up in so many ways, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, because, because, of course, you're really exposed to the complexity of the world, you know. And that makes you vulnerable on, on every possible level thinkable. And you somehow need to deal with that. And then the second thing I wanted to say, what I really admire about um, digital designers and specifically also software engineers, is a kind of a, a, a professional code I see with some of the best people I have been working with, both now with our startup, but also in earlier projects. For example, in the Volkswagen project I have shown you, or even earlier when I was working with Kohlhaas on the Prada projects. You know, there are software engineers who are like the stonemasons in the Middle Ages traveling from project to project and bringing their toolkit and knowledge and with that building these contemporary software cathedrals uh, which of course are highly collaborative complex works uh, which however is made possible by people with talent and um, and that I also greatly admire as a as a way of existing in this world and um, yeah, so, so I think, I think there's also um, an ability to learn from each other in terms of the respective toolkits each of you have. You know, so how, how is somebody able to have a voice, um, both individually as well as in a group? And, um, and also here, this transdisciplinary work, I think, is highly... Uh, highly educational and really interesting.